Um, first off, thanks for the invitation to come talk to you tonight about our project. Um, as stated, Connexus, we built and brought online last year 10 megawatt solar array integrated with 15 megawatts of lithium iron phosphate batteries with 30 megawatt hours. And it's a distribution voltage grid connected system. Um, in the next half hour or so, I'll be giving you how we did this, why we did it, and tell you how we're saving money for our members. Um, the kind of the brief background, I've been doing this talk in less than 10 minutes. I've testified at the state capitol the other week. I've been doing a lot now. I've been asked to expand it. So I'm going to give you the full storyline, the steps we went through, some of the challenges we had with citing, why we did it, and then the, the actual results of the business case of it. So Connexus Energy, this is here on the right, 1,000 square miles, 54 cities and townships, portions of seven counties. Connexus, we're a member-owned distribution cooperatives. The members own Connexus, and in turn, Connexus is a member owner of Great River Energy. They're a generation and transmission company serving two-thirds of the state of Minnesota. On the left, you see the gray areas. There's 28 member systems within the Geary family. The majority of the generating assets are in North Dakota. They have a large 400,000 volt KV or 400,000 volt DC line that brings power down from Coal Creek Station down to Buffalo, Minnesota, and converts it back to AC. Um, they have peaking facilities in southern Minnesota. They have wind turbines in both South Dakota, Iowa, and North Dakota, and we're adding more wind turbines. But I'll be talking about Connexus specifically here. Um, we're the largest co-op in the state of the 44. We have 135,000 members. Two-thirds of our membership lives within a half hour of downtown Minneapolis or St. Paul. That group of members drives our system peak. If you think of the typical office building, retail that's seven by 16, manufacturing that's seven by 16, seven by 24, base load, you add back to it all these homes where people return from working on a first shift operation, them leaving in the homes, cooking, cleaning, drives our system peak late afternoon. Um, Connexus, I said, we're a member-owned utility. We buy our power from Great River Energy. We have an all-requirements contract. And what that means, we get all of our power and all of our energy from Great River Energy. We can't own generation, but for renewables. Within that power supply contract, we have the flexibility for 5% self-supply for renewables with the caveats that that renewable energy system resides within our service territory, no power flows back onto the bulk transmission system, and we don't reduce our billing demand by more than 5%. GRE is our MISO participant. Their entire generation fleet sells into MISO, and all of their power supply comes from MISO. GRE joined MISO back in 2004. The advent of the market has precluded energy prices from ever going over $1,000 a megawatt hour. Back before MISO, back in the summer of 1999, Coal Creek, Geary's main power plant went down for an entire week. It was an extremely hot week. By the end of the week, we were paying over $4,000 a megawatt hour. It's $4 a kilowatt hour to turn around and sell it for a nickel. The market and the ability would have brought all those power plants and the dispatch on price has mitigated that exposure. But GRE is our power supply participant. We're not a MISO participant. And we sell energy to members. We also buy energy from members who have qualifying facilities, meaning solar, wind, excess production. We do buy it from them. When I'm talking about MISO, MISO goes all the way from Manitoba all the way down to New Orleans. A lot of summer capacity comes into Minnesota from Manitoba Hydro. And you'll be hearing more about that in the state legislators this year. Large hydro doesn't qualify as renewable, but small hydro does. And there's a lot of people making a play trying to convert their large contracts to small, including Great River Energy. But I just want to give you a perspective. When you hear the words MISO, what does that mean? The Midwest Independent System Operator goes from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. In terms of our business case, it's integrated solar plus storage. It's at megawatt scale. And when I say megawatt scale, that means large enough to get economies of scale on the pricing. On the distribution grid means we interconnect at our 480, not transmission. It's a cost-effective way to do it. In demand response design, 
We are aligning the solar production with our system peaks to increase the monetary benefit to Connexus and to our members. Right now, when the sun comes up, our solar system generates power and goes right to the grid. On probable peak days, we notify NextEra, our storage partner, to take that solar energy and put it into the batteries to be discharged later in the afternoon to align with our system peaks. Um, this gray area right here, this represents solar production. And as most people understand, sun's at the highest midday, that's your highest solar production. But as I talked about, those two thirds of our membership living within a half hour downtown Minneapolis, St. Paul, when they come home, our system peaks late afternoon. What we're doing with those batteries is aligning that solar production from midday and aligning it with our system peak when the sun is either set or the sun is going down, um, that definitely increases the monetary benefit to our membership by integrating solar plus storage. Some of the drivers and aspirations behind it, we're a member-owned utility, we operate in the members' best interest. Back in 2016, we surveyed the membership as part of our three-year strategic plan, and we heard overwhelmingly from our membership, yes, add more renewables. Everyone's in favor of adding more renewables, with the caveat, don't increase our rates by doing it. And that challenge came to me, hey, how do we do this? How do we increase renewables while decreasing costs or holding costs flat? In December of 2015, the federal government extended the production tax credits for wind, extended the investment tax credits for solar, and they added the inclusion, if you use renewable energy to charge a battery, that battery system qualifies for the full 30% investment tax credit recoverable over the first five years. It was in February of that year where this concept started percolating in my head. Hmm, solar prices are coming down, Battery prices are really coming down fast. What if we marry the two up, monetize the investment tax credit on the solar and the batteries? Does that make sense? We brought it to our board strategic planning. And they said, yeah, let's go for it. Let's get some real pricing. The pro forma seems to make sense. Um, the batteries enhances the greener economy. Um, we're gonna, we are greening the grid now for the last 60 days without raising member rates. And we're learning from it. Batteries, in our case, are demand response. We have visions for batteries for other things, from power quality improvements. We have only 120 electric vehicles right now on our system. We foresee a day, and those that have them, they're clustered in certain developments, that if you have a whole development full of EVs, instead of bringing in net new infrastructure, transformers or wires, batteries is a non-wire solution you could place in that neighborhood and perhaps use the battery to be our shock absorber to charge those electric vehicles or handle the peaks and loads from an EV perhaps. But those are some of the drivers and aspirations behind why we did it. Our membership is telling us add more renewables without raising costs. Siting challenges. Um, there's three things that we needed to look for. Our project, we went and found the land. Uh, we knew what the land prices could be. You had to have all three to coincide. You need to find affordable land you need to be in a community that's gonna give you a permit because not all communities want solar. And you need to have the interconnection capabilities. I started off early on talking about the caveats. The power cannot flow back onto the transmission system. So we need to find areas we have either three phase adjacent to the site or in close proximity. We need to have enough daytime electrical load during all hours of the year so that the solar energy was absorbed within that local substation area and didn't flow back out. Those are things that we as a utility would know versus some of the other projects you see in the same Minnesota, the issue of blanket RFP, go out and find the land. Then the utility says, yes, no, it works, it doesn't work. We went and found the land. We went and talked to the local units of government. We have a relationship with the majority of the cities. We went through the permitting process as the representative of the developers. We want to do this integrated project in your community and I did all the conditional use permits as well. I had this notion, hey, let's find some loads, areas where we have land, where there's load close by, lands that have minimal other values. The first site we evaluate was a National Sports Center. Um, I'm assuming the majority of you understand that in Blaine, Minnesota, the, the second most visited location in the state per year. Um, lots of soccer fields, golf course, baseball fields, and, 
they had a 40 acre closed construction landfill, closed construction waste landfill given to them. They tried to grow seed on this to, for a field for lacrosse, it couldn't take. Um, there's a couple old hotels built in this. A lot of Blaine is low ground, a lot of muck. When they were building roads and digging out to build roadways, they put that muck on top of this hill. So it's tabletop flat, ideal location for solar, in my mind at least, set back more than 500 feet from any of the adjacent homes. National Sports Center wanted to do it. We were gonna put money in their pockets. Um, the neighborhood came out in arms. Um, you might have seen there was an article in the Center for the American Experiment blasting us how dare we think of doing a solar garden on top of this old construction waste landfill. Um, we even offered for the entire 170 members, we had an open house, we were gonna green their usage for 25 years with wrecks from the solar garden. We were gonna put up a decorative fence all the way around it um, to the tune of an additional $300,000. It, 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 it went so bad we pulled out of there in December of 2017 and said this isn't gonna work. Even though societally it was a great spot, a couple substations close by, a lot of reasons why we wanted to go there. Site number two, the city of St. Francis. They had their own municipal wastewater system. The ponding here, they were in the process of connecting to the Musa line. This ponding area was gonna be abandoned, dredged out. It would have been ideal. Again, minimal other uses for this property. Um, we spent a year working with them and unfortunately, they weren't able to get the pond and area remediated in the time frame that we needed to do our project, uh, but this is still another potential. But here again, you have land in close proximity to load so that solar energy could have stayed within that local community, and it would have been a great one. We spent a significant amount of time working on that, but it didn't happen. Anoka County, um, cities and counties own all kinds of land. We went to an county, hey, if you have any excess land, we'd like to lease it from you. Here's what we're trying to do this project. Oh yeah, we have land we bought for the bridge crossing from Ramsey to Dayton that no longer aligns with the plans we have. Um, it's hard to see it, but there's three different parcels here. They said, we want to keep the front two to develop for industrial or retail, perhaps along Highway 10. But this back quadrant, this back 18 acres, that'd be a great spot for, for solar. Um, and they were our first, land lease option we signed and this is the home of one of our projects i'll talk more about it this is equidistant from two of our substations electrically is great we have a load in the, a lot of load in the area and the city of ramsey was great to work with in terms of that conditional use permit athens township is just south of the city of isanti you've heard of maybe cambridge isanti um, it's about an hour north of minneapolis this was our backup site all along. Um, this landowner had over 1,800 acres. He didn't want to take up any of his farm fields for the fact that he already had center pair of irrigations and growing crops there. But he goes, hey, I have this old growth oak. It's got oak wilt. I gotta cut the trees down anyway. I'd like to have you put your solar here. We just went through the experience in Blaine where nobody wanted to see this. This site's a quarter mile off the road, so 1,250 feet from the road. Um, we were able to do some clear cutting, but leave a lot of the trees along the edges, again, for screening. Screening is very important to these solar projects. And I heard it again, we're down at the state capitol on Tuesday. Um, the North Star Project up by North Branch and the representative from that area, people don't want to look at solar panels. They're willing to look at a pole barn, a grain elevator, what have you. But it's like, Brian, we got to make these solar panels black on the backside. They got to blend in. They just look ugly. Um, so as you guys talk about the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society, that NIMBY is, is loud and clear. Areas out here in Athens where it's one home per 10 acres, that's rural to a lot of people. When you go to that township meeting, they're saying, these projects should be out, out, out far, Brian, out in the rural areas. And you're kind of going, well, I kind of thought it was, but in their minds, um, everyone likes renewables, just not perhaps in their viewpoint or near their house. <coughs> So kind of what we landed on, I talked about Athens. It's in the northern part of our system. All the load stays in that area. Ramsey, um, all the energy, we have a lot of load going on in Ramsey. That's where our corporate headquarters is. That's kind of our show place. When people come to my corporate office, we take them out to show them the Ramsey site. 
This is the top-down view, how the Ramsey site lays out. It was kind of that weird shaped parcel, solar on the left, the batteries on the right, with the collectors kind of in the middle. This is the original design. This is actually what it looks like. We have 3.4 megawatts of solar out here. Each one of these white containers holds one megawatt of inverter capacity, two lineups of 500 um, kW with one megawatt hour per side. So each one here I'm talking about, it's a 500 kW inverter with one megawatt, hour, one megawatt hour of energy. So each enclosure is two megawatt hours, one, one megawatt. So we have six megawatts of batteries here, two megawatt hours. Um, the ratio we chose, back during the polar vortex, we had multiple cold days back to back. We had to drain the batteries down and have enough solar production to bring the batteries back to 100% the next day. And we had that on Tuesday and Wednesday during the polar vortex. And that's why the biggest monetary benefits in the batteries, but to have enough solar to be able to charge back to back days in the wintertime, the days are shorter. Um, that's the sizing ratio here. And the solar is the enabler to get the ITC on the batteries to get that discount. Athens, I talked about, we had those trees there. Um, top down is what we submitted for our conditional use permit. Um, and, the, and the batteries in the lower right. This is the best picture I have for right now. Um, the camera got, we had a time lapse camera on a pole and it, it's gone missing. So I don't, ha I don't have the final photos. Um, but it's a pretty cool site. And here we have nine enclosures, so nine megawatts with 18 megawatt hours of capacity. NG um, used to be SoCore Energy out of Chicago. They were our solar developer. Between the two sites, we have over 41,000 panels um, on 54 acres of land, all planted to pollinator habitat. Back in 2014, Conexus, we built a 245 kW community solar garden. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a baby in size today. But back in 2014, that was the largest community solar array in the state of Minnesota, 245 kW. That's right outside of our corporate office, right outside of the marketing department. When utilities typically build projects, you have to do vegetation management. And the traditional engineering way to do it is some type of crushed gravel aggregate. And the marketing people, and this is a true story, can we do something different? We're gonna be looking at this for the next 25 years. Can we do something different? Um, Prairie Restoration Incorporated is a member of Conexus Energy. We reach out to Prairie Restoration, hey, give us some design options to do vegetation management. That phone call led to the planting of native prairie grasses at Conexus low growth height. Um, we did it for aesthetics. It was fast forward a year later, Fresh Energy, Rob Davis came out and saw all the black eyed Susans. It was almost dancing through the flowers. Do you guys realize what you've done as far as pollinator habitat? And I'll bet, not really, but that was kind of the, the, the start of it. The native prairie grasses, the pollinator habitat. The next year we added beehives to the site. Um, Bolton bees, they grow a Minnesota hardy bee variety. Those hives had the highest pounds of honey, the ratio of production. It was the best producing hives they had anywhere because of the proximity to all the native prairie grasses without any herbicides. Um, and that's really become kind of the showcase. We've been everywhere from Pheasants Forever, one of my favorites, to Martha Stewart, to Utility Dive, talking about our native prairie grasses. Um, Fresh Energy would come with me when we were go applying for these conditional use permits, and Rob would tell the story about the benefits of native prairie grasses, and I finally said, you know what? We're gonna change this permit application. We're gonna tell them we wanna plant native prairie grasses and we're gonna finance it by putting solar on top of it. We'll get a permit approval easier. <laughs> um, this, the pictures of the flowers, and then when people start to understand the benefits to the surrounding areas from water quality, um, it became kind of a no brainer. And we made it our standard. We will only build solar with pollinator habitat and then go forward. Next air energy, there are battery developers. Um, we did two separate RFPs. We did it to 10 highly qualified solar developers. We wanted to find the very best possible solar developer, and we did it to 10 very highly qualified storage developers. Some are the same. I think we had two companies that weren't on either one. Um, 
But next year, in my mind, and I apologize if there are any battery developers here, but hands down, they're the world leader in battery storage development. As part of the due diligence, my boss and I, the CEO, we went down to Juno Beach, the corporate office, to meet with their executives to talk about batteries. They have their own R&D test facility where various battery manufacturers send their batteries to Nextera to test them. Um, two years ago already, they were taking BMW batteries out of cars that maybe had 50% life and combining them into a utility container to do storage for utilities, second life batteries. I mean, they're ahead of the curve. When people would say, hey, Brian, I want to build your project. How many projects have you done, sir or ma'am? Tell me how many, what size? Do and they started on KW, like, no. We're like people who've done multiple megawatts. We went down to Nextera and their NERC certified system operations center. Huge wall, all these monitors, and they're monitoring all their wind turbines across the world. They have a smaller section of all the solar installations. There's another couple of monitors. Then they had one small, small monitor, but it was all their battery projects. But at least they were monitoring and operating battery projects back in 2017. Um, but they've been a great partner. Again, I talked about it's a lithium iron phosphate battery. It's in the lithium ion family, but for our demand response application to go 25 years, 75 cycles per year, the lithium iron is slightly better, it's more expensive, but it's a better application for our current design we wanted to do here. Um, we didn't get our final permit from Athens until June 4th. Planning and zoning in May 25th of 2018, I'm talking now, gave us a thumbs up. We drug our feet signing the deal to order these batteries until after that May 25th meeting, speculating across my fingers, we get the permit on June 4th. The cancellation fees for these batteries was a seven figure cancellation. So we felt pretty strong we we're gonna get this, but order the batteries on May 26th, and we got them installed and operational by December 23rd, 2018. December 23rd is a Saturday night. We did the final testing where they charged them all the way, brought them all the way back down make sure all the inverters held and everything. And I got the text, hey, it worked. I'm all excited, told my wife, hey, I got my early Christmas present. She didn't quite get it, but like, this is a big deal that these all came online before Christmas to get this done um, in a relatively short time frame. 10 megawatts of solar is the equivalent to about 1,800 homes in annual usage. By taking that energy and putting it into the battery, it's like removing 7,000 homes from our system peak in the summertime. That's how significant the economics are. Again, 7,000 homes is the equipment we're taking off of our capacity requirement for generation and also for transmission. And that's the reason we did the project is that demand response while adding renewables. Project timeline, so this really started February of 2016. I was at the conference down in Florida at the Net Energy Conference, the new emerging energy technology, learning about the tax credits, learning about batteries. And that's where the idea got rolling. Um, we did our strategic planning in July of 2016. By that time, we already had a pro forma brought forward to the board, hey, here's this concept. At that time, we were gonna do 10 megawatts of solar charging 20 megawatts of batteries. Um, we went to our power supplier, Greater Energy. They weren't so interested in us doing that. They wanted to limit what we could do as far as integration. And it was a negotiated settlement. They wanted us to do 10 megawatts solar, 10 megawatts of batteries, and we split the difference 10 and 15. Um, but that all took place in, in the 17. I, I was talking to the consultant for Grand Rapids Municipal Utility. They're trying to do a smaller couple megawatt solar array, a couple megawatts of storage. And Minnesota Power is pushing back on them, just like GRE pushed back on us. And she asked, Brian, how long did it take you? Two and a half years. God, that kind of sounds kind of long. I'm like, there's a lot to it. When you have separate developers, you have to have a joint operating agreement. To get the tax credits on the batteries hasn't been done very much. To get a PLR, which is a private letter ruling from the IRS saying, yes, this project qualification, it takes six to eight months to get at least, and they weren't given any back in 2017, 18. Uh, it's expensive and very timely. Where <laughs> Nextera had the courage to say, hey, this configuration will do it. We'll guarantee the IATC in this pricing. Uh, I didn't talk about it, but it's a virtual microgrid. So we have separate developers that we match the instantaneous solar output to the battery for us charging. Say that again, the batteries are being charged at the same rate the solar is coming out. 
So we don't have to disconnect from the grid. We don't have any virtual or, or black star functionality. It saves money in the operations. And this virtual microgrid works for the IRS to get that investment tax credits. Um, that joint operating agreement was not easy to get two developers to work together to share resources. And the concerns of, well, what happens if your solar breaks my batteries? What happens if your batteries break my solar? To go through all that litigation or negotiations. Um, if anybody knows anything about tax equity, they like zero risk. The tax equity investors want everything mitigated. Uh, it takes a while. But it was two and a half years from the board saying, hey, the performer looks pretty good. Let's go through the RFP process, the contracting to get it developed. The key takeaway, the difference from 2016 summer, what we use in the pro forma for a dollar per KW month assumption for the batteries, and we had a consultant from GE assisting us to what we actually ended up paying two years later was less than half. We cut the rate in half. Um, for the unit of energy we're getting from this 10 megawatts of solar and 15 megawatts of batteries, we're projecting at least a 25% savings from our baseline. So we'll have successfully added renewables, not just maintaining costs, but decreasing costs on these units of power by 25%. Um, the other question I get often, do batteries and do solar work in the cold? Um, just two weeks ago now, the polar vortex. I took a picture. So first month of the shoot, January 1, brand new system. I'm the one telling the board this is going to work. We've done all the modeling. I'm the one that signed off on it. And we get snow on Sunday, on January 27th. And I'm like, are we going to have enough energy to charge up the batteries? Batteries don't like being at 100% for longevity. You leave them at a 50% state of charge, those lithium ion batteries, that's where they rest at. Um, so I needed 15 megawatt hours on Tuesday to charge it up, I drive out there Monday morning, and there's some snow on the panels and it's cold. And it's the polar vortex, as cold has been in 20 years. And it's nothing we've modeled, our regression based models is based on the prior four years and we haven't got any cold weather. Is the snow gonna slide off these panels? Um, I went out there Tuesday morning and they look like this, like whew, thank goodness and it's bluebird skies, and we were able to charge the batteries up and do a full discharge at night. Well, the next day, we had a, the coldest day in 20 years. It was 20 below at noon. We had the second highest solar production in January on that coldest day. On June 30th, we produced over 35 megawatt hours, put it into the battery, did a full discharge, and saved almost $300,000 that one month for the membership by doing that. So the answer is batteries and solar do work in the cold. Um, January 30th, it was a MISO max generation event. Um, MISO North was anticipating between eight to 10,000 megawatts of wind being online, and they had less than half of that. Um, wind turbines struggle when it's down below 20, 20 below zero, they struggle to operate or just take them offline. Um, that's what got us into that event. But during the MISO max generation event, this system performed as designed. Um, so as a recap, with the 10 megawatts, it's a fixed tilt, two sites, 54 acres of land. The batteries, 15 megawatts, 30 megawatts, so it's a two hour battery. The next there is our partner. Um, two and a half years from the July 2016 strategy to December 23rd, 2018 coming online. Um, the surprise is the G&T challenge. Batteries in Minnesota, batteries in Colorado are being perceived somewhat as a threat to G&Ts. They have a lot of attributes similar to generation. They're certainly not generation. Simply a device to store energy and respond to the price signal from these G&Ts. Um, the co-ops and the munis, we're the prime market for batteries. We're not vertically integrated. We see a demand charge every single month. And when you think of demand response, the words, in response to the demand charge, what actions can we take? And batteries are becoming a lower cost solution in certain applications versus the standard generation transmission charges that we incur. Um, the NIMBYs, I thought I had a home run at that closed construction waste landfill. I thought greening the usage of all these high-end homes, giving money to their homeowner association to put on their monuments, a green power development, um, I was wrong. 
I was actually pretty shell shocked. I was, it was in a room like this, but it was packed. And not one of those residents was in favor of what we planned on doing. Um, it was changing their view. It was changing their personal playground where they rode their four wheelers, walked their dogs. They didn't have a care about renewable energy. They didn't care about the rec screen in their homes. They didn't want it there. Um, and really the value of that pollinator habitat, that story, I can't tell you enough how powerful it is, planting the native prairie grasses. Um, I spoke the other week down at the University of Minnesota, the Ion Institute of Environment. Um, Ellen Anderson has been a big supporter of our projects and I've done probably six or seven panel presentations with her. Uh, in exchange for all the help she's given us, we gave them a donation to further the research and study of pollinator habitat beneath solar gardens, the value to surrounding ag, the value to water quality in soils, and that was the panel I was on. Um, but there's a lot to be said for pollinator habitat, the environment, and water quality. Learnings, the ESA structure, in an energy service, everyone knows what a power purchase agreement is. Um, it's a risk mitigation strategy for our board of directors. We don't pay federal income taxes, so we don't have a way to monetize the ITC. You do a PPA and the developer monetizes that. Um, when it comes to batteries, an energy storage agreement, net new, never been done before. I call it the valet parking analogy. Just as you pay a fee to a valet attendant to park your car, for that fee, he parks your car and gives it back to you. We pay a monthly fee for 30 megawatt hours of battery storage service to Nextera. I pay him a fee, they take our electrons, and they give them back to me later in the day. It's that valet parking analogy. Um, telemetry and controls, you can't just dump nine megawatts of power into the grid from a different point all of a sudden without having controls back to your voltage regulators, controls back to your substations. You have to have the telemetry real time to balance the voltage on the system to handle the fluctuations of solar, but also that block loading of storage. So you're feeding from the substation here, instantaneously it's all being fed from the batteries and to manage all that and the engineering learnings. The risk management talk about the ESA, we're indifferent if the batteries don't operate, if the batteries catch on fire, that risk is on next year. They're the battery operators, the experts, we're not. Um, maybe in future years we'll own our own batteries, but for the first time the board said, hey, we want to mitigate our risk. That's what came with this ESA. Um, stakeholder relationships, um, working with Fresh Energy, Ellen Anderson University of Minnesota definitely has help with our conditional use permits, getting those done, very, very important. Um, and that's the local acceptance, grid integration, and land economics. Those are some of the learnings we had on our first project. We'll be doing an RFP, releasing it next month. We want to build up another seven megawatts of solar in 2019. Um, but we've hit our max, our contractual maximum with greater energy. We can't do any more batteries until we get some contract modification or some flexibility there. I talked about the Black Eyed Susans. This is our community solar array at Connexus Energy, our corporate campus. Um, this is what the year one, what the native prairie grasses look like. Low growth, they don't get high enough to block the solar panels for our solar production, and it makes the site look good. So with those ramblings, I apologize, but I'll take any questions you guys have. What triggers you to discharge the batteries, and are you getting 30 megawatt hours, full, fully 30 megawatt hours injected into the... We're getting 15 megawatt hours per hour for two hours for 30 megawatt hours. So 15 megawatts for two hours. Correct, for 30 megawatt hours. Okay. And what triggers it is our demand charge we get from our power supplier. It's building a coincident demand. So we're monitoring Great River Energy as a whole. When are they peaking? And one of the things we're doing is discharging the batteries as far as responding to their price charges to us. So is it more that when you're peaking that you have to keep your peak down or why do you have to worry about Great Rivers? So that's the power supply. So on a pre-MISO concert, before MISO came in the market where they have all kinds of power plants and dispatch the lowest cost resources, utilities were a load serving entity. And as a whole, all 28 cooperatives, how much generation do you need on a coincident basis? And we still have these legacy rates that are based on coincident of the 28 member systems. And that's the, the rate structure we have currently. That's why we respond to that rate signal. But we have a high correlation between our system peak and their coincident peak. Um, Co-ops by nature are mostly residential. 
which is late afternoon, early evening. I used to be a rate consultant doing work across the country. And uniformly, um, co-ops serve a more rural residential area, and they have that load shape where they peak late afternoon. Go ahead, hey, you want to? So I, I have a whimsical question and a serious question. The, the, the whimsical question is, from the little I know about native prairies, uh, one of the important things is periodic wildfires. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do about that? So the tax equity guys don't want you to burn down the, the, the flowers. Um, the mowing, Prairie Restoration does the mowing. And I didn't mention this, besides it looking better, the native prairie grasses and maintenance is the least cost solution for vegetation management. So it was literally, it was back 2018 summer of flowers looking great, we're all talking about it, like this came, what happened to our flowers? It was part of the prescribed mowing. They had to knock them all down for that prairie grass, yes. The, the, the serious question is, um, you know, you're contractually limited in how much renewables you can put in your system. You know, if you didn't have that, would you have gone bigger? Was, would that have helped? Or is this kind of important? I don't know if we would have went bigger if this one. It was a pretty big bite to take off. This is the largest storage project in the state of Minnesota. It's the largest in the Midwest, and that's the biggest batteries in Indianapolis. They have a 20 megawatt battery that Indianapolis is power and light. They're using it for transmission services. You have to go pretty far west to find a battery bigger than this. Um, it's going well so far in our first 45, 50 days. But if I could, I would have been adding batteries to this next go around of solar for sure. Uh, you're using lithium iron phosphate battery, which uh, looking for batteries on all those systems. I discovered that uh, they've got uh, three times the energy de density of uh, SLAs and uh, a lot of advantages. But one of the hits they have is that uh, you couldn't be using a car up here very easily because when you get below about, depending on which numbers you look at, about 20 degrees below zero, they don't work. But they are used a lot out west, and even somebody put one in an RV, but he put it inside the RV the battery. So have you had any issues with the temperature? So they're in a climate-controlled NEMA 3 enclosure. Um, batteries are very intense. Heat mitigation is more of a concern than warming them back up. Um, the air conditioning low because it's so dense inside of those containers. Sounds like a jet turbine if you have the doors open. Um, but there's, for those 15 containers, there's between 220 to 240 kW of ox power, which is mostly heat, um, on those very, very cold days. So the, they are climately controlled, both for heat and cooling. Does uh, this, you're working on a new era? Next era. Next era. Yeah. Do they uh, also sell smaller batteries? Or? No, they're a, a utility scale developer. I mean, a lot of these wind farms, Gray River Energy has, I think 400 megawatts of wind turbines. They're a, a major developer. They're a 17.5 billion a year company. Um, they're, they're global, but they don't do residential batteries yet. I had difficulty finding anybody who actually manufactured the batteries in this country. In this country, all the cells came from China, and they're basically assembled into batteries in this country. Short of the Tesla product, yes, that's correct. Our batteries came, they're Lysian brand, they came from China. Again, we ordered them May 26th, and they were here installed by December 23rd online. Do you uh, uh, offer off-peak uh, metering for electric vehicle charging? I'm just gonna rifle a couple at you. Um, how much has your demand for uh, kilowatt hours from Grand River Ranch has been reduced compared to how much your demand charges have been reduced. Okay. And uh, uh, I guess that's it. So the first one's yes. We have two options for customers with EV. They can go on a time of use rate where you have off peak and intermediate price period and a peak period. You can separately meter just your car or you can put your whole house on it. And if you put your whole house on it, 
we'll guarantee you over a 12 month period, if you paid more on the time of use rate than you would have on the standard rate, we'll refund you the difference to get you to try it. So we have that, and that's been a very popular option. Then we have even a lower rate that allows you to charge your car from 11 at night to seven in the morning. Um, so you're precluded from seven to 11 at night. You can't, the 16 hours, you're blocked from getting energy, but you pay 4.35 cents per kilowatt hour, no power cost adjustment for that storage energy. Your second question, how much have we reduced from our billing peak? Yeah, so uh, how many kilowatt hours have you cut off your demand for greater over energy? And how much has the demand charges come down? Well, so the demand charges aren't going down because that's the, the pushback from a G&T. So their fixed costs in the short run are fixed. Um, therefore, if you have less volume, same fixed cost, your average avoided rate goes up. And that's kind of the pushback. But in the long run, the level's set. That gets normalized. Um, so we've only had the discharge, the peak in just January 30th, and then the peak of record for February was February 8th. That Friday was 14 below zero. Um, but both times we were close to 15 megawatts discharge. Um, the first month of learnings, there were some communications issues where some of those lineups, each side of the container is a lineup that we're cutting in and out a little bit. So we're working out the bugs on that. Did I answer your questions enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, kind of. It's it's super interesting uh, part of the business. Yeah. You say you've got this five percent constraint for renewables that you get from, or that you can do based with the Great River Energy. What about your members who want to put up panels or something on their you know at their property? How does that play into that five percent? That's doesn't play into the fire. The fire percent is what we procure. Um, we like to say we're open for business. We like working with members doing solar. We have our first member in Line of Lakes this month who's adding solar and Tesla wall packs to his house. We'll be taking that excess generation beyond what his house is using, instead of selling it back to Connexus, <laughs> putting it into his batteries, and he'll be discharging those batteries at the same time that we are for demand response. What's the economic benefit to you for discharging during that demand response time? How, <coughs> is something that can happen 30 days a month or all, every day of the month, or is it just one day a month that actually you're shooting for and you don't know when that day is? Well, we do have a good idea. It's weather-driven events. We have the historical, when we've peaked in the past, our load shape hasn't changed, the GRE load shape. It pretty much is what it is, the manufacturing, retail, and residential. 24 times 30, there's roughly 730 hours in a month. 729 hours could be around a nickel. That billing hour on average is close to $20. So if you can take those solar electrons and align them with the battery and discharge them all over that $20 hour, that's the monetary benefit we're talking about. It's significant. And that's what Great River Energy charges you for that one hour. When I say 20 bucks, that's the average that GRE uh, MMPA, Tri-State, Dairyland, these are all names of G&Ts or municipal power that sell power on a monthly basis. Minnesota Power to Grand Rapids. That's the pricing charge they have. That's why I say municipals and cooperatives are the ideal candidates for battery plus storage in a demand response application. Vertically integrated utilities, they don't have that. That's why you don't see Excel clamoring to do this yet, because they don't have that price signal. You had a question, sir, back? Yeah. Can you recap what or how you took advantage of the federal tax credits? We pushed it back. It was a requirement for Nextera and for NG to monetize it. So we pay a fixed dollar per KW rate for that energy storage agreement for 25 years. In exchange, we can only charge the batteries with renewable energy. There's a caveat that if you use anything less than 75% of the energy per year to charge the batteries, you don't qualify for the ITC. If you only use 75% of the energy is renewable to charge the batteries, you only get 75% of the 30%, so 22.5% ITC. Um, so the agreement we have, we will only give them grid, or get, excuse me, only give them renewable energy for the first five years to charge their batteries. In exchange, we get that low fixed rate for 25 years. So if it's the <coughs> that's the hottest day of the year, 
you might think that's probably weather driven and going to be a demand response thing, but how do you know the next day is not going to be the next the, the next hottest day of the year? I, I'm just yep. It could be every <coughs> month you have to be ready to discharge the battery, or is it? Not so I'm already it's what it's February 22nd. I'm already looking at March one. It's going to be cold. It's for the month of February. We have no more cold weather like see we had on the eighth. Um, I have an individual in my area, super smart data scientist, taking the last four years of data for hourly GRE, the various weather stations, um, all kinds of neural learnings that go into this regression based m model. And I have an app on my phone, as a lot of us, it's a DS distribution system operation dashboard. Uh, it tells us the probability of being a peak, tomorrow's load profile, and the pr next day after that. Um, with our contract, we get 75 cycles. A cycle is a full charge discharge per year. So roughly five or six times per month, we could cycle and discharge the batteries. Um, lithium iron batteries have about a 10% loss efficiencies from charge. It's de minimis in terms of the energy losses versus the demand savings we have. Um, so if we're close, we're gonna do a charge discharge cycle to make sure we hit it. I'd rather burn all 75 cycles than save 40 of them, but miss a, a peak day. But you're, you're right. If it's the first day of the month, you have to be looking into the, the forward forecast. And not to beat this too much, but just so I can understand yeah. it a little bit better, um, then, then what hour of that day? Is it the peak at the hour that you would have the peak? Like if it's cold weather, it might be in the morning. If it's hot, it might be during the No, it's, it's, it's always late afternoon, early evening. It's always late afternoon, early yeah. evening. And it's a certain time, and it's not based on your usage, but it's based upon Great River Energy's peak. Yeah. And a two-hour battery, it could be, we have models where we do a two-hour discharge, 15 and 15 megawatts, three hours, 10, 10, 10, or four hours, seven and a half. It, it depends on, on, on the month. But when it's extremely cold, it's really defined when we're going to peak. So if you were to roll this out to the residential customers that might have their own energy storage, um, how would, um, how, <coughs> since they're only injecting into your system, how would they get, you would get credit for reducing um, the demand of Great River, River Energy? Since 2003, Anoka Hennepin Schools, the largest schools in the state of Minnesota, has ice storage systems. So it's different than a battery, but still a storage system where they make a chilled brine throughout the day that they convert their air conditioning at their high schools from standard refrigerant to this chilled brine given the signal we send them. Uh, we're a member on utility to the degree they help us lower our expenses, we lower their expenses. Just last week, we were selected by the Rocky Mountain Institute. They have what's called an eLab accelerator program we submitted an application to create a behind the meter battery storage game plan. You could have seven people on your team, so it's myself, CEO, Greg Ritterbush Connects Energy, our counterparts from United Power, it's a co-op in Colorado, Brenton, also Denver, Ellen Anderson from the University of Minnesota, Michael Dobo from Fresh Energy, and an executive from NextEra. We're trying to figure this out. How could we develop a game plan to do battery storage across the country behind the meter? You know, uh, uh, Vermont Public Utility, uh, Mary Powell. I've heard Mary speak. Yeah. Don't they have like a great model where they say, listen, uh, uh, we'll give you a Tesla Powerwall for 15 bucks a month, and uh, that thing will be there to run your critical loads in the event of an outage. Um, but what she secretly did was she said, tell you what, I'm going to charge your Powerwalls when I have too much energy. And I'm going to use energy from your power walls when I don't have enough. And I'm charging you 15 bucks a month to solve my problem. And the people are signing up for it. They have a whole whole development that did it. I think uh, it's fantastic. It's kind of like win -win. it's like you and I talked about. Every store, big box retailer, has a UPS to prevent the front end from dropping off. They don't want to lose sales. I have a vision of doing batteries behind the meter for demand and response with a selling point. It's a UPS. You don't need a standby generator or grocery store. You don't need a UPS target. We're gonna put a UPS from your entire facility. We're gonna do demand response and increase your power quality if there's ever a blink from the utility. Um, that's, that price point is coming, it's getting close. 
um, probably a couple years out. We're hoping to develop this game plan with the Rocky Mountain Institute in 2019 with the plans of doing a pilot in 2020. But yeah, the, what they do in Vermont, what Mary did, was pretty cool. She's pretty smart. Yeah. And the, the cool part of it is that she's getting other people to pay to solve her problem. Mm -hmm. She levelized her demand, mm -hmm. and she's got a nice place to put her cheap energies. You had a question in the front row. Uh, you mentioned air conditioning your batteries. Is it actually compressor air conditioning, or is it fan? Outside um, I, I, we were there in December when it was pretty chilly out and the compressors were on. It wasn't just free, free ventilation. Um, the enclosures are pretty small. They're non-walk-in. There's not a lot of space in there. There's a lot of power intensity with those batteries. If you've been to a data center where they have the racks of servers, inside of these enclosures there's racks of batteries. They're about 150 pounds a piece, two guys, and slide them into the rack. Um, batteries never just truly die. Your iPhone doesn't just die. When it gets older, it, it doesn't last all day, perhaps. And what they do in these containers, they will augment the batteries by adding additional batteries to always give us 30 megawatt hours. But the back third of the racking is left open. The slots are available for batteries to be slid in. But yes, it is refrigerant cooled spaces. What percentage of the energy produced by the solar system is used for conditioning the battery space, either heat yeah. or um, air conditioning? So it's a separate service. That energy is coming from the grid. And during the coldest January 3rd time period when we were peaking, there was 230 kW of ox power going to those 15 enclosures. The 10 megawatts of solar has about 10 kW of auxiliary power for the controls out there. Brian, just a different kind of question. I read someplace where a bunch of utilities are now looking at doing pollinator gardens in their substations and stuff like that. Have you guys looked at that or considered it? Or? Not inside of the substation, but in right-of-ways in areas that we can, yes. We have done that. Okay. Where can all my friendly co-ops go to learn what you're doing and do replicating? Um, so last month, RE Magazine, Rural Electric Magazine, um, we, we, it was the front cover was the battery boom. There's six co-ops in, in the United States doing batteries and so, solar projects. Um, I, I've been on the speaking circuit. I mean, I've been asked multiple times to come here, and I, I do this quite a bit. Um, I've done it at the National Energy Storage Conference last fall. I did it at the previous National Energy Storage Conference. Minnesota has the Minnesota Energy Storage Alliance, and I've spoken at that a couple times. Um, I testified at the Capitol the other week. I spoke at the U the other week. Um, we're definitely getting the word out. We've been, Mike Hewlett from the Star Tribune has interviewed me several times talking about this. There's a lot of interest from the co-ops. So the, the, uh, the, generate, the generation companies like uh, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Power, don't they generate a lot of electricity for a lot of the co-ops? Minnesota Power? Who, who, who? I forget the name of the company that generates the power for so many of the co-ops. Great River Energies are, then there's Basin Electric, there's Dairyland, there's Minn Kota. Minn Kota's one of them. But Minnesota Power is the one supplying power to Grand Rapids. It was in the paper earlier this week. They're trying to do a solar for storage. Yep. And they've reached out to us. And so uh, so uh, take a city like uh, Grand Ray, uh, they're trying to become uh, fossil fuel neutral by 2040. And uh, what kind of a objection is Minn Kota going to put on them if they try to do uh, solar plus storage or wind plus storage or solar and wind and storage in combination? Um, when they get it fully deployed, uh, they're going to end up just using the code of power just to fill the gaps and uh, it, and the base load, maybe, maybe the base load and the gaps. How, how, how much pushback is the code going to give them and how, how do you manage it? Um, it's a contractual risk. There's going to be a fair amount of pushback. So GNTs don't have defined service territories. They don't have members. Um, we talked about this earlier. Connects as a defined service area. We don't get to pick and choose who our members are. There's a must-serve obligation for that. Yeah. To get financing to build a power plant, power purchase agreement, what have you as a G&T, they need these lengthy all requirements contracts for their lenders to feel secure about giving them money to build a power plant, knowing they have a contract with a utility that has a defined service territory. 
So if an entire city tried to bus free from the grid, they'd have to pay an exit fee equivalent to their fixed obligation for those resources that were built to serve them. Now, I doubt Brent Murray is going to try and bus, bus free from the grid, but they're going to try, I'm sure, to generate and store enough power to eliminate their demand charges to basically make themselves a levelized. Yeah. It'll, it'll come down to the fixed investments that were made on their behalf and the recovery of that, because someone has to pay for it for society. Yeah. It's great to replace it, but there's still an expense to be paid, and we have to be fair on that. How, how long are those uh, uh, goods amortized over? So our current contract for all requirements goes through 2045, and that's one of the shorter ones. Okay, fair enough. Brad, um, what's the comparison between what you guys have, and I understand XL's got a pretty good sized system in Colorado, are they comparable, or is yours bigger? Or um, I'm not aware of any solar plus storage that Excel has in Colorado combined. Okay. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm not personally aware of any project like that. They told us that they've got their big, because I asked them why they have, but I think in Minnesota, they're doing their experiment in Colorado, so. This is a pretty good size experiment, 54 acres and 15 megawatts, so it's, it's beyond a pilot. You mentioned about RECs. Um, are there are there in Minnesota? Is there a rec market now? I trying to. So it wasn't in the past, and I know there's <coughs> talk about it, but you mentioned it, and I'm just wondering where it's at now. So the generation assets are registered with Emirates as the Midwest Renewable Energy Tracking System. Um, there is a market, but the price is de minimis. That's why I was able to offer it up to a development, hey, because there really isn't much value. I mean, we're washing wrecks with all the wind turbines. Solar wrecks are more expensive, and companies that have a sustainable philosophy or are being pushed back from their retailer to manufacturing, they must be green. They're looking for the lowest cost wrecks to meet that requirement. Um, we have a manufacturing facility that does a lot of work with Walmart, and Walmart uses their power to push back, you shall be green and then they buy wind wrecks from us to green their usage. Right now, 25% of all the electrons coming out of the outlet from our members is already green. We already have 25% renewables, so that member is buying the differential that is 75%, they're buying the wrecks from us to green it. Yeah. Any other questions before we get shoot out of here? It's almost seven. Time for one more. What do you got, one? One big one, and hope it's in the back there. Um, <clears throat> over in that Lovey, it's in Michigan. When they produce extra sort of electricity, they put water uphill. The pump to have hydro. Uh, a big battery. Is there anything like that in the western states? I don't know in the western states, but there is in, in the North Shore, the University of Minnesota Duluth. They're working on projects that pumped hydro. Um, I'm not familiar with the western states, but. Excel has got a new project out in Colorado. Anyway, thank you, Brian.